my great pleasure this afternoon to introduce you to Father Ivan Kostak, the very Reverend Dr. Ivan Kostak, who's been the pastor of Holy Trinity Ukrainian Catholic Church in Pohosu, since 2011. Is that when you left off? 2011? Just about. So he was ordained back in 1984 as a deacon, and then he became, he um, went on and became ordained a priest after that in 1985. He earned his master's in theology, and in 1997 he earned a master's in education, and then he completed his doctorate in religious education in 2005. He, I'm not going to go through some of the places he's worked, but he's used to be the pastor here at St. John the Baptist Ukrainian Catholic Church, which is my family's parish, and that's how I got to know him. And he is um, well known in the cir circles of intellectuals who know about some of the great Ukrainian martyrs and Ukrainian priests. I'm not sure if I'm representing you exactly right, but he's published that's several fine. books Better on that than topic. I represent myself. <laughs> and he's going to talk to you today about the power of evil from an Eastern Christian perspective. I've asked him to speak for about 40, 45 minutes, and then he'll open it up to questions and try to answer your questions. His friend is recording it for us, a member of his parish in um, Pohangsa, New York. Paul, I forgot your last name. Machai. Machai, I'm sorry. Um, and he's gonna be recording this. When you do ask your questions, if you would please give your name, or at least your first name, so Father knows who you are. And without further ado, I'll turn it over to Father Ivan. Thank you. You're welcome. It's good to almost see you guys. <laughs> and as one of my friends says, when he looks in the mirror, it's amazing what five plus billion years of recycled matter can become. And uh, says so it's an interesting way of looking at it, but we're going to be talking about evil and good, but I'd like to begin with love because the best manifestation, at least most people agree with, of goodness is, is love, the relationship of one person loving another or loving many people. So love is one of those things that no one has seen and almost everyone believes in. I don't know if you're too old for Shrek or is Shrek in your, in your memory banks. Remember that song that Smash Mouth did? It was a redo of The Monkees uh, written by Neil Diamond. I thought love was only true in fairy tales. And then at the end he goes, then I saw her face, now I'm a believer. Mm -hmm. And uh, we see signs of love, but no one sees love. So if you want to love any person for the rest of your life, you have to believe they love you. You will never know that they do because all the external signs of love can be fake and sometimes they are. So the universe is 3.8 billion years old. The Earth, a little bit younger. Uh, I was listening to one person says that when you speak about both science and religion, you should be humble. How old is the universe? Is it eternal? How old is it? The correct answer? I don't know. Both science and religion are developmental. We started not with chemistry, started with alchemy. We started not with the various religions we have today, but with all other attempts to look at life, things we did not understand and things we do, and find some comprehensive theory to put meaning into existence. Richard Feynman once said when he was asked about the meaning of it all, he says, I don't know. But in admitting that, we may have found an open channel that is the key to understanding. So being open-minded is also looking at evil and good and trying to figure it out. From a religious point of view, there is an old joke that goes like this. Two fellows are talking about religion. One says to the other, sometimes. I would like to ask God why he allows poverty, famine, injustice, when he could do something about it. Well, his friend says, what's stopping you from asking? He replies, I'm afraid he might ask me the same question. 
So for religious people, when faced with evil and knowledge, I like to give a good quote from Clint Eastwood. The spirit ain't worth spit without sweat. We found hospitals, we found universities. You use the gift of your intelligence to try to figure stuff out, to try to help the human condition. There's a beautiful, nice documentary called Faith, Hope, and Science about a small Franciscan nun who saw suffering and did something about it. And she founded the Mayo Clinic. It's a nice documentary. If you ever have a chance to, please do. It is not God that I do not accept, but the world he has created. So said Dostoevsky. The early Christian writers because what I'm trying to represent tonight to you, this afternoon, is the Christian approach to good and evil, both in orthodoxy and Catholicism, because they often meld together. And so the early writers in Christianity said, we have never seen the world God created, but the world that is sick by the sin we have chosen, by the dysfunction we have adopted, and according to those early writers, like both Augustine and Thomas Aquinas, sin and evil is not a creation, but a destruction, a lack of something that should be. A building that has been torn down is not something. It is a lack of something that should be there. Page two. Your silence is nice, but since you, you we met for the first time today, you can't see me smiling, and I can't see you, which is what we have to do at this point. But it's, it's interesting during the question and answer period, don't be afraid to ask and tell me your name and see what happens. The early Christian writers and the Russian writers were affected by the same things we are. Why is there evil in the world? Evil is a human creation or deprivation. Then why can't God stop it? David Hume, in his famous dialogues concerning natural religion, writes, is God willing to prevent evil but not able? Is he impotent? Is he able but not willing, then he's malevolent? Is he both able and willing, then whence comes evil? Epicurus did it much earlier when he talked about the gods that he knew. The defense of the early Christians was free will. We are free. We need to choose freely. And one of the laws of the universe that we know is cause and effect. Something is done, both the laws of motion, of an action, the laws in physics, and the laws in psychology, that whatever we choose to do, there is always a concomitant result or oppositional action. Being good, God wants the world to have freedom. Because the only thing God cannot do is the same thing we can't. You can't force someone to love you. You can make it easier. You can make it attractive. But no one can make the choice for someone else. Thomas Aquinas, in fact, says, since God is supremely good, he would not permit any evil at all in his works unless he were sufficiently powerful and good to bring good even from evil. So it belongs to the limitless goodness of God that he permits evil to exist and draws good from them. This is not a convincing statement, but it was one of the statements 
that affected the Russian writers, they also knew, which most people don't know, that the Christian and Jewish scriptures says God is omnipotent, all-powerful. That does not mean that he can do everything. He cannot violate himself in the sense of doing something contrary to logic. He cannot make a square triangle. He cannot will himself out of existence. He cannot be the cause of evil. So for the early Christians, the omnipotence of God does not mean that he controls everything because he has to allow freedom to have goodness and to have love. In the 60s, way before you were born, there was a common saying, the price of love is the possibility of its loss. If you want anyone to love you, you have to give them the freedom to do so. If there is insecurity, then people tend to settle for a facsimile of love. So proximity replaces intimacy, at least they're here with me. Stimulation replaces satisfaction. And anything that can eliminate my loneliness is good enough because I'm too afraid of having freedom to have love. Well, in this view of good and evil and of love, the Christians also had an unusual saying, that life is fair. People say, what do you mean life is fair? Suffering, cancer, etc., death. Because the goal of the Christian life is not to have good things happen to you, but for you to become good. You are free to choose anything, but not everything you choose makes you free. It can imprison you, it can take away your ability to love, it could even take away your life. So some people may say, but it still doesn't make sense. Well, I say, is atheism bad because atheist people and governments have killed millions of people in peacetime? Is religion bad because religious people have done the same horrible things? Is science bad? because scientists and engineers have made war possible? No. Truth is independent of character. Two plus two is four because it's true, not because I'm good, and it's not false because I'm bad. And the same thing with all religious beliefs and atheistic agnostics belief. They, they, if they are true, they are true because they are so. If they are false, they are false because they are so. The truth or falsity of a contention is not so because I behave well or I behave poorly. I always say I want the best surgeon as soon as he gets out of prison to do my surgery. <laughs> I don't care how he or she behaved. So the determination of behavior affects the people around you but it does not affect the verity of what you claim. In fact, in the, in the Christian scriptures, everything begins from the human soul. That is why the battleground in Russian literature is the soul. So in James chapter 4, in the New Testament, the Christian scriptures, it says, what is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Is the source not your pleasures that wage war in your body, your desires and you do not have so you commit murder, you are envious and cannot obtain so you fight and quarrel, you do not have because you do not ask, you ask and do not receive because you ask with the wrong motives so that you, you may spend everything on your own empty desires. So in the Christian tradition, all of creation is good. There is no such thing as an evil substance, an evil animal. Everything is made evil 
by its abuse or misuse. Money is an empty symbol into which we pour our desires. No one wants to have money for the sake of money, but they want to have money to do, get, or live somewhere, somehow. So money is an empty symbol into which we pour our desires, and the Christians say, money changes owners every day. Do not sell yourself short. Wars start inside. Orthodoxy and Catholicism are not monolithic. What I am presenting to you is one viewpoint which I think is reflected in the Russian writers that you have read, but people who are not raised in these traditions think they're monolithic, one-sided, not multifaceted. The example often given to show that they are different is St. Francis, which is often called the Apostle of Poverty, the Apostle of Nature. If he were given $100, he would give it to the poor, fix whatever he could, and the money would be gone in a day. If you gave it to the founder of the Jesuits, he would invest it in a bank and help people for 100 years. Both are valid ways of using what is given for the good of humanity. But in Christian theology, evil is an infection. Every human being is more valuable in than the entire universe. One of the sayings of Jesus in the New Testament was, what good is it if you get the whole world, and in Greek it's cosmos, the universe, and lose your soul, lose yourself? What can you give in exchange for yourself? So this idea of the individual human being being of eternal worth and in the Jewish tradition, if you save a human life, you save the world. You save all the generations that will come from that human being. You have affected love. So evil is an infection, a disease. You've heard the phrase maybe, love the sinner but hate the sin. If you have ever had a friend who has had some debilitating disease or a psychological trauma, or even a dependency on some substance that they couldn't control, your love makes it very easy to differentiate the dysfunction, the disease, from the human being. In the Christian dispensation and the philosophy, this is what the Christian is called to do. There is a difference between the infection and the human being who has been laid low, who has been attacked by their own choices. So if you hate the person, how will you be able to distinguish yourself from what you hate? You risk becoming the evil that you hate. They, I believe your professor told me that you finished Journey into the Whirlwind, that was your last book. And there's a lot of evil throughout the novel, the satanic web, demons in hell, the cell door closes behind me. Everything since then had been only my wandering after death, though hell. She describes feeling as though she has been swept away by some evil power. Now I worked once in the maximum security prison and evil can even have a taste and a feeling when you go to the deepest parts of what the human being can choose. Yet even there, there, the evil we do is not us. It is not something which is we were meant for. In the real sense, the love that we express and the way we try is always a sign that we are fighting for ourselves. <coughs> Just like telling a child, who's responsible for your education? You are. Who's responsible for your life? You are. Ultimately, everyone will help, your friends, your family, everyone who loves you will try, but the decision in all those things 
has to be that way. As an example of a, another wrong way, if a person comes with cancer to a doctor and the doctor with hateful language and actions begins to beat up the patient, instead of curing the situation, the doctor makes it worse. Hatred is evil wrapped in self-righteous hypocrisy. Don't you see that you become the object for your hatred? How will you cure the problem and how will you love yourself? Martin Luther King had a saying, hatred is like taking poison and waiting for the other person to die. Forgiveness is very similar. When you forgive, you do not justify evil, nor do you say it's okay. We have a wonderful image in Christianity. When Jesus rose from the dead after the crucifixion, all his apostles sort of ran away because he came with all the wounds in his arms and feet and his side. And the Christian saying about forgiveness is, remember and forgive doesn't say forget. It's a common misconception. You should remember evil so you don't end up in the same place, so that you can both protect yourself and even the person that was the cause of the pain. Because every time we begin to nurse those who are sickest among us, it makes the world a better place. So. When the Russian writers read the Christian and Jewish scriptures, there are two parts in the Jewish scripture, and then there's another part in the Christian scripture where the world is as God created. The first two chapters, no death, no sickness, no earthquakes, everything's okay until sin screws it up. Then the last two, in the book of the Apocalypse, Revelation, most movies are made about Armageddon. If you read the last two chapters, they're about God wiping away every tear, no more death, no more pain, but only life without end. How people got to make heaven a place where you sleep, I don't know. Who wants to sleep forever? <laughs> Only if you're in the university, then you get up and you want to sleep forever. But normally you want to live life. You want to do stuff like most of you want to do. So the Bible says we have never seen the world as God created it. But let's take your imagination for a trip. Imagine today, no more sickness, no more death. Anybody tries to hurt you? Magically, everything is stopped. The world is as it should have been the way God created it, the way we would like it. Would this be a wonderful, beautiful place? Not necessarily, especially if we still hate each other. We would be frustrating because we could not kill one another. We would live forever, and perhaps the hatred would grow, or it could be the opposite. It would still have to be, if we're human, the human choice of each individual to choose whether they want to live a life of love, compassion, or if they want to live a life of hatred. And destruction is not a choice anymore. But the worst frustration is wanting evil and not being able to do anything but what human beings do now, destroy themselves before they destroy others. So we want our freedom, and we want God to control the universe. I don't know how that is possible. For some, evil is a problem, and for some people, it's a way of life. Repentance comes from the Greek words metanus, changing your mind. It is a way of thinking before it is a way of living. In the Russian writers, sometimes they focus so much on pain that we miss the love. When the early Christians saw a crucifixion, are we getting close? No. Okay. I'm saying it so too. Okay, I'll well, wait till the first body drops. <laughs> when people look at the crucifixion, they see pain. For Christians, 
they see love. A person who decided even that the people who were crucifying that he loved them, he refused to condemn them, although he condemned their actions. And so when we look at anyone going through a difficult time, for the Christian, the answer is always, okay, life is going great to you. Are you a good person? Are you a loving person? Or are you the cause of more evil in the world? Oh, things are going so, so, so. Question is still the same. Are you loving the right way? Are you trying to make the world a better place? Things are horrible. You have a disease, you don't have long to live. Question is always the same. How are you as a human person? Are you making the world a better place? Or are you trying to make the place a place with less evil in the world? Remove grace and you have nothing whereby to be saved. Remove free will and you have nothing that could be saved. The free will is the price that God pays because he wants us to love each other and love him. But like all of us, we are powerless to force it. There's an old song, love is a flower, but if you pick it, it dies. It needs that freedom to grow. In this world, the Gulag Archipelago, fascist or Nazism, they all had some truth in it. Communism, for example, promises equality. I myself was born under a communist regime. It's always better to be whatever you want to be in the United States. It's harder to be whatever other government there is that doesn't have the freedoms that we enjoy here. So in order to have a good world, Stalin used to say, and you've heard this probably, you have to break a few eggs to get an omelet. So in order to get social harmony and to reduce the evil in society and create a socially equal society, communist, Soviet Union, killed millions of people. When evil or murder is your social method and social program, it probably will make it very good for some people and very bad for other people. C.S. Lewis, as you know, the Christian writer, started out as a non-believer. Eventually, he became a believer and he wrote a book called The Screwtape Letters. It speaks about a young demon getting trained. How do you fix it so that people lose their freedom and become not only trapped by evil, but cause more evil in this world? And this is the older demon teaching, talking about God. He's a hedonist at heart. He makes no secret of it. At his right hand are pleasures forevermore. He's vulgar. He has a bourgeois mind. He has filled his world full of pleasures. There are things for humans to do all day, sleeping, washing, eating, drinking, making love, playing, praying, working. Everything has to be twisted before it's of any use. One of my friends says it's like going through life, you want to be a gourmet, not a glutton. You want to choose your pleasures well, enjoy them, so that you can enjoy what life has to offer for the rest of your life. Eating 40 pounds of chocolate a day will not make chocolate taste any better. So eat, become a gourmet. So God creates all things that has free will. That means we all can do either wrong or right. Some people think they can imagine a creature where free will had no possibility of going wrong. I can't. And this is what C.S. Lewis says. If a thing is free to be good, it is also free to be bad. And free will is what has made evil possible. 
why then did God give us free will? Because free will, though it makes evil possible, is also the only thing that makes possible any love or goodness or joy worth having. So love is not simply an affectionate feeling, but a steady wish for the one you love to have the best life, the best things. Where evil came. In Matthew, got, and this is a quotation from the gospel, I think the only one I will quote tonight is, this, Jesus explains in an image how evil came to the world. All these arguments are not convincing and will solve the problem of evil, but at least you will know this is the Christian approach in orthodoxy and Catholicism. So when you read the writers, you know from whence they are giving their arguments and drawing their pictures. This is what Jesus, he left the house and sat by the lakeside and he told them parables. A sower went out to sow the seed, but he told them then another parable. The kingdom of heaven may be compared, and when they speak about the kingdom of heaven, it's here. It's all the people who are good. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. While everyone was sleeping, his enemy came, sowed darnel. It's a Eurasian ryegrass, all among the wheat and made off. When the new wheat sprouted and ripened, then the darnel appeared as well. The owner's laborers went to him and said, Sir, was it not good seed that you sowed in your field? If so, from where has the darnel come? He said to them, Some enemy has done this. And the laborers said, Do you want us to go and weed it out? No. Because when you weed out the darnel, you might pull up the wheat with them. Let them grow until the harvest, and we will separate them then. Some people often say when they see evil done, why doesn't God, if there is one, get rid of these people? The Christians say, be very careful how you treat the children of the God you pray to. The goal is not to eliminate, but to cure and to change so that life can be a better place. Human beings are not disposable, they are recyclable. We tend to recycle all the elements and that's good. We do try to rescue all kinds of pets and it's good. But sometimes because of our frustration, we tend to want to eliminate human beings, not recycle, not save, simply eliminate. This is not the Christian way how to do it. Solzhenitsyn quoted and he cited in the introduction to his speech about the commencement, I believe it was in 1978 at Harvard. He said that the line between good and evil passes not through states nor between classes, nor between political parties either, but right through every human heart, through all human hearts. This is why the early Christians used to say, our churches are not museums for saints, but hospitals for sinners. <coughs> if you are perfect, please go to the mall. We don't want to mess you up. Another book, in book chapter 5, in the Brothers Karamazov, did you forget that peace and even death are dearer to man than free choice? In the knowledge of good and evil, there is nothing more seductive for man than the freedom of his conscience, but there is nothing more tormenting either. I don't agree with that. It's difficult. But that doesn't make it tormenting. You know, it's like some people when they joke about Christianity. And by the way, comedians are the worst people to learn about religion from. They're good. They have some good insight. But it's like I want to be a surgeon because I listen, you know, to a comedian. I love comedy. I love comedy, but be careful uh, about getting objective facts. So 
evil, there is nothing more seductive. There's a joke that goes like this. Christians receive their guilt from the Bible. Everyone else gets it from their mother. I apologize to all mothers. <laughs> but in the Christian approach to evil, guilt has this one role. If you do something bad and you feel guilty, guilt is like pain. Do something about it or shut up. I'm sorry if that sounded harsh, but that's the true teaching. But sometimes people say, well, my group of people want me to feel guilty. No, they want you to make up your mind. And if you think it's not something wrong or sinful, then forget about guilt. It's a psychological condition, not a moral statement. But for most of us, and I've worked in maximum security prison where people will murder someone and go to lunch and have no guilt at all. So guilt has a person, a purpose, just like pain. My arm hurts, I go to the doctor, fix it. But if for five years your friend says, you know what, my arm hurts, my arm hurts, go to the doctor, fix it. Well, that's, that's what happens with evil. Fix it or stop complaining about it. St. Ambrose was a saint, although he was from Italy, affected the Russian writers. If you remember, Catherine the Great allowed the Jesuits to be part of the social structures because they had good schools and good hospitals. And so he allowed them to flourish when the Roman church actually forbid them to flourish in the West. So in the Brothers Karamads of nourishing, nourishing the soul, is even more important than nourishing the body for your soul as cultivated through a virtuous life outlives the body. And the second statement, a virtuous life is one that shows love for everyone in thought, deed, and honors everyone, that holds hatred in the heart for no one. Because as you are wounded by evil in the world, you should never be the host for the parasite called evil that can be propagated only by your participation. So evil dies if you say no. You have to live through the pain, but the glory is the victory that you have, that you have preserved your own integrity, and you have made it easier for other people to live. In Anna Karenina, they always called a struggle of evil. And I think everyone who has had any evil, we all have experienced evil in our lives. In fact, Jesus, when he was asked by disciples, how often should I forgive? Seven times a day? No. 70 times 7. It's a Semitic way of saying all the time. Why? Because forgiveness is the struggle for your own independence and happiness. Unless you want to carry on someone else's garbage in your heart and your life and blame it on people who may not, you may never see again or people who are even dead. I don't know if you've ever had that experience. But evil is a struggle I think almost everyone would admit except those people who have given up the struggle and think that revenge, anger, hatred, etc. is a better way to go. In the Christian dispensation, you have to fight for your own identity. Evil is mesmerizing. Temptation to give up the fight is always there. And there is always truth in the other side, except there's a proviso or a little small print thing. And let me give you an example from the Magnificent Seven. The guy said, how's things going so far? He goes, well, so far, no good. Mm -hmm. It reminds me of the guy who fell out of a seven-story window, and each story that he passed, the people heard him say, so far, so good. So when you give in to evil, evil exacts a price. On the way to destruction, 
it gradually begins to take your life and take the happiness away from your life. When anyone attacks you or hurts you, like the old saying goes, they have been hurt first. Hurt people, hurt people. People who are hurt like to hurt other people because they cannot contain the pain. When you stay in opposition, you are always fighting for yourself. When you give forgiveness a chance, you are fighting for yourself, fighting against those ideas that want to control and poison and to say, don't be happy, you were hurt. Don't find any joy, start sulking. Don't look to the future, look at the past and see how much pain was given to you. The Irish have a saying, there is no future in the past. The Christian idea of evil, it is a struggle. It is illusory and mesmerizing and often looks much better than where you are and at least it's a change and it's different. But the Russian life, and if I could add the Ukrainian life, the Belarusian life, because these are the three countries that may be fighting soon, I hope not. It elevates the soul and forces us to become better. Psychologically, if you over, we're getting close? No, no, no. Okay. So, right. okay. Psych, I grew up with a couple of sisters and I always have to be careful about that because <laughs> they always look at me eventually and say, you're talking too much. Oh, no, no, no. So, no. although the struggle is difficult, Although the opposite destructive forces are always promising us everything and eventually taking everything from us. And some things are so counterintuitive, but we either become the source of evil by carrying other people's evil and hatred, or we go for freedom and realize that there is another human being that has lost themselves, that is in so much pain, because have you heard of anyone who gets up and tells you, I feel so good today, I've achieved so much, let me go and ruin someone else's life. <laughs> you almost never see it. But it's a great responsibility. The Grand Inquisitor, you can see Brothers Karamazov is one of my favorite novels, the Grand Inquisitor, however, looks at the idea of spiritual freedom and condemns it. For him, freedom is a burden that most humans are simply unable to shoulder. Freedom, free thought and science, will lead them into such straits and will bring them face to face with such marvels and insoluble mysteries that some of them, the fierce and rebellious, will destroy themselves. The Inquisitor says, others, rebellious but weak, will destroy one another while the rest, weak and unhappy, will crawl fawning to our feet. It's kind of bad. It doesn't make me happy at all. So in the characters depicted by the Russian writers, not each of them describe the Christian approach to reality, the Orthodox or Catholic approach or even the Protestant approach, but they simply echo some of the dysfunctional choices and approaches. Because as C.S. Lewis says, the creator wants joy and pleasures as long as possible for every one of us and life without pain thereafter. C.S. Lewis says this, to love it all is to be vulnerable. Love anything? and your heart will certainly be wrung and possibly broken. If you want to make sure of keeping it intact, you must give your heart to no one, not even to an animal. Wrap it carefully round with hobbies and little luxuries. Avoid all entanglements. Lock it up safe in the casket or a coffin of your selfishness. But in that casket, safe, dark, motionless, airless, it will change. It will not be broken, 
it will become unbreakable, impenetrable, irredeemable. So the goal is also accomplished by those who are courageous, who those remember their eternal worth. The whole universe is not worth as much as any one of you. And people will tell you that if you do this or do that, it's easy. There is no easy road to freedom and to love. As we began, love is an act of faith, of belief. The one thing we can do is make ourselves more lovable, more believable, and hope other people will take that chance and then we will become more lovable to them. We will trust them, believe in them. And people who have given up the fight will think they have found the greatest refuge. A silly idea is current that good people do not know what temptation means. This is an obvious lie. Only those who try to resist temptation know how strong it is. A person who gives in to temptation after five minutes simply does not know what it would be like an hour later. That is why bad people, in some sense, know very little about badness. They have lived a sheltered life by always giving in. The longer we remain the way we are, the longer things remain the way they are. Whoa. Whoa. I'll wake anybody up. Attention, students. So do you get a break or do you want to ask questions? No breaks. Okay. So it's spoiled. Like a chiropractor. <laughs> Who's gonna start? We're like see your ears perking up. One, three, seven, eight, two, nine <laughs> are the lotto numbers. There's three or four students here who have done the Dostoevsky and Tolstoy classes. Two are As you can tell, Dostoevsky is my favorite. I have not read all the works you have read, but hopefully I've given you an idea of what Orthodox and Catholic approach to is, because sometimes when you read the Russian writers, they're giving you a false, because that's the character. That's the problem with this character. He or she has this approach, and it's wrong, and it ends up with pain and suffering. Every life has pain and suffering. How do you deal with that? And, and once again, it's a struggle for yourself and for your own identity. How do I save myself? And accept, especially so I don't become this person with spiritual suicide. You know, my life is, you know, um, as an example, do you guys know about seatbelts, how seatbelts were discovered? Right, well, it just uh, simply, a person decided in looking at car accidents said there are actually two accidents. When a car hits an object and stops, and then when the people inside begin to bounce around and hit objects, that's two accidents. I can, I can prevent the second one, so I put seat belts. So when I speak to people, it says, you can't prevent people from hurting you, but you can prevent yourself from regurgitating and repeating the evil that was done to you and look to the future and create and forgive, not because it didn't happen, not because the person is free, but because you want to be free and you want to live your life. So be honest with yourself. You know, if the person hurt you, they hurt you that one time and the pain is long, but don't add to it by, you know, so repeating it every day, every day. Then you say, well, that's me. That's me hurting myself. That's me afraid to move on. That's me not being able to take the pain. And that's when you may need friends. So just based off of everything uh, you talked about, would you say that the belief is generally that forgiveness is more important for the person that is forgiving than the person that's being forgiven? Well, in the, in the prayer that our Lord taught us, it's not called the Christian prayer, by the way. The Our Father is called the Lord's Prayer. Because you can't pray without thinking everyone is brother and sister. So it says, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive. So I had a sermon once. I don't need your forgiveness. 
If I say I'm sorry and I'm truly sorry and I'll do whatever I can to make up, and if you say, well, I'm not going to forgive you, I says, I really don't care. It's not my, that's your problem. I'm sincere. I'll do anything to make up for it. I'll try to repair any damage I, I've caused, but I'm, I'm not a victim of your refusal to get on with life, and I really don't need it. Because the Our Father doesn't say, only forgive me if the guy accepts my forgiveness. Does, does that make sense? You know, so, so sometimes it's, it's really counterintuitive, you know. There's an old joke about that. Two people get into a fight, and the guy says, I won't forgive you until I die. And the other guy says, well, I hope you don't have long to wait. <laughs> so do not be the victim of manipulative people who somehow think they can withhold forgiveness. That's their issue. That's their problem. Our Father says, I have to be sincere in my apology, and that's all I have to do. Make sense? My name is Dominique. Um, so, in the book Journey to uh, Journey to the Waldron, um, they talk a lot about suffering and the purity of suffering. And so, um, it made me start thinking. So, I was just wondering if you agreed with um, that statement or sentiment that suffering can be purifying. Psychologically, yes. If done the right way. In other words, Jesus suffered on the cross. That's not what Satan is. He loved on the cross. So how are you suffering? You know, are you bearing it well? Psychologists will tell you that some of the most horrible times in your life or tragedy, we make the most advancement in personality. And all of a sudden, if I went through this, I can go through anything. You know, you've heard that statement a lot. So when, when you have the experience, you've been knocked down once, you know what it's like to be knocked down. But suffering in and of itself is a useless thing. I mean, unless you're masochistic, you know, sadistic, yeah, suffering has a purpose. But as a human being, who wants to suffer? Not me. I want to be happy. I want to enjoy life. However, suffering does test my love, my commitment, my resilience. So... There's a book written about Jesus called The Wounded Healer. He was wounded, but he heals. And if you ever visited people in the hospital, they may be dying and suffering, but they can bring you so much healing because of what they're going through. They see what's important about life. And I've, I've visited people and oh, so happy to see you. You know, they're dying. But, but they value human life. So. You have to be careful, people who value suffering for suffering's sake. That's usually a psychological trauma or a very self-destructive thing. Yes? In your opinion, is What's there your any, name? Will. Will, Will. In your opinion, is there any sin or action that isn't forgivable? The only one is that you don't want to be forgiven. There's an old saying from the fourth century, but can God free all the people of hell? says yes, but they didn't want to go. If you've ever encountered someone in dependency or someone has self-destructive behavior and people that really love them and they want them to change, they'll say no. Or leaving Las Vegas, the movie, you know, he has a girlfriend, he says, look, the only thing you can't stop me from is killing myself, drinking myself to death. I don't know why I want to die. You can be my girlfriend, but you can never tell me to stop drinking. Horrible thing. Yeah, so there is no sin that's forgivable if you want to be forgiven. And, and that's, that's where people sometimes make a mistake. It's very difficult to say when someone's being a hypocrite or someone is really trying and failing. So if they're at that point, they're really trying, they're about to make a breakthrough. And we call them a hypocrite and crush that little spark of life that they want to redeem themselves, then you might make someone who's really trying and failing a hypocrite. Or the, make it worse than that is they've given up totally. You know? It's a battle in life, and hopefully you want everyone to be on the same team. You know, believers are not believers are not an issue. Do you believe in humanity? Great. Let's try to make the world a better place. And this idea of using religion or belief to be a lazy person, oh my God. You know? Prayer and work used to be the motto in Latin, ora et labora, in the monastic life. 
work it tell up. The spirit ain't worth spit without sweat. You know, <laughs> if you want to be lazy, then nothing comes to you but old age. I have some questions maybe that relate to what you're working on to either your next oral report or your your paper. So how does this concept of ego have Father Ivan clarified it more for you or caused you to think more deeply about the work that you're reading or the project that you're working on that will um, deal with this whole theme of evil, the whole course well, of we, One thing atheists, agnostics, and believers have in common is sin and evil. We all experience it, and no one refutes it, because everyone has a personal experience. You know, it's one of those objective, verifiable things. You don't have to ask anyone. Everyone's been in pain. Everyone's felt evil to be the cause of evil. Uh, my name is Brady. Brady, um, pleasure. Like I'm writing my final paper about like um, religion and evil, but like I guess the question I have, like a lot of the books you read in class, um, they weren't very devoutly religious people. Like Adrian is the one where Dini was like devoutly religious, but like, how do you think like her and other people with like similar experiences were still able to pull through? Like without like you say like regurgitating that evil back onto the people she was around, even though they like it wasn't coming from like a religious perspective. Like. Because. In my point of view, God doesn't only work through religion, he works through everything. And loving human nature. So I can talk to an atheist agnostic. If we're both doing things, like do you think in the, the Mayo Clinic founded by a nun, do you think they're all believers? No. If, if we're doing good, I consider myself to be on the same team with you or anyone else. Because we won't both want the good, right? My goal is not to make someone believe what I believe, but to make someone have a better life. And they may or may not believe in the Christian church. The only one that converts is God, and even then, God gives an option. You can't force someone to believe, just like you can't force someone to love. And in history, both lovers and believers have tried that option. It doesn't work. You know, put a gun to your head, you have to believe and be this faith group. Or in the Soviet Union, you know, I tell my atheist friends, I go, you know, they killed more people in peacetime than all the religious wars in history because they had more technology. So you're always stuck with the same human animal, the same building block, the same human being. And if we're both caring about people, and those people, just because they don't believe in God doesn't mean he's not there. People have never met you, that doesn't mean you're not here. And we're, I consider ourselves on, on the right team, and those people who are bad, that's my brother, that's my sister, and I have to help them. Just because I disagree with them, even think they're dead wrong, that doesn't mean I have an obligation to leave them behind or somehow hurt them. I have to give my life for them, and hopefully vice versa. And two times in the Bible, Jesus was amazed by faith. The Roman centurion, who was not a Jewish person or believed in God, and the Syrophoenician woman, who did not believe in the God of Israel. And Jesus says, wow, God, I haven't seen such faith anywhere in Israel. Why? Because God is working all the time. You know, and uh, hopefully I don't get in God's way. Yes? Uh, my name is Jack. Hi, Jack. Um, I consider myself to be a Christian, um, but like where I'm from, or like in today's society, well, I come from like a pretty rural, conservative area, uh, and a lot of it's like faith-based. Oh, New York City? What'd you say? New York City? No, sorry. I come from a rural, <laughs> faith-based area, not New York City. Okay. I was raised in the Bronx. <laughs> not even close. <laughs> okay. Um, but, um, you know, some of the people back home, like me and my friends, sometimes think that they use religion, like uh, to cherry pick, or like, you know, even sure. more in society, some people think that, you know, religion is used as a vessel for evil. Sure. So what would you say to like, that or like to those people? No, you just always go with the truth, right? Mm -hmm. I can take a piece of bread and feed you, or I can kill you with it. Anything can be abused. The Soviet Union didn't use religion, they used social theories to take away human freedoms. So whatever, whatever philosophical approach you have to life can always be abused. 
You know, it's like the person in their life, you know, when they're handsome or beautiful and they figure it out, like they're the most handsome, how can I use this? Or how can I become a better person? So if you consider beautiful things like religion, it can be used great or it can be used to manipulate people, to control people. You know, Johnstown, Johnstown in, in Africa, what was the name, the guy who had the, the Kool-Aid to kill people with? Jim Jones. Jim Jones. Yeah. Jim Jones. Absolutely. You know, priests and parishes can abuse people. Atheists can abuse people. Mm -hmm. You know, and when they asked MTV about their advertising project, it says, how do you know what young people, this is in the 80s, they just came out. You know, how do you know what kids want? It says, our goal is not to give what kids what they want. Our goal is to have a product and make them want it. Mm -hmm. So you talk about do, advertise, manipulate things without any concern, the cigarette industry. You know, sure, sure. Do doctors do bad things? Do, do scientists become mad scientists? Sure. Science and religion, the only problem with them is that we are in it. In other words, the human animal, wherever you put us, it's that struggle which the, the writers speak so much about. You know, well, I can get a promotion if I just lie on my scientific research, if I steal it. Well, I can get this parish, this position, I can get this money if I only lie, you know? So the good thing about the Bible, it, it lists all the horrible, evil things. It doesn't hide it. Judas betrays Jesus and hangs himself on a tree. If you're starting a religion, that's probably a bad thing to put forward, but it's the truth. So yeah, you call evil by its name, and especially when you learn to do that about yourself, you're on the way to healing because you know what's wrong. Yes. My name is Joa. Um, so in the Soviet Union, there were a lot of, you know, because of the hierarchical political system, there were a lot of um, people maybe in the middle of the political system that were carrying out evil acts, but they weren't necessarily doing it from their own intentions, but maybe from the fear that they would be the ones being uh, punished, perhaps. How, in, in these types of cases, how would evil be like addressed or maybe punished? Well, culpability or our own human responsibility for our actions are always mitigated, mitigated, lessened. In other words, if someone puts a gun to me and says, shoot him, which is what they do with the social structures in the Soviet Union, if you don't do this, your children will not go to high school. If you don't do this, we will send you to Siberia. So yeah, it, it's a mitigation of evil because you are under duress. And so evil is there, evil is affecting you, but your responsibility is lessened. Now there are some people who will do the ultimate price and say, even if you kill me, I will not do evil. And no one knows, you know, will you have the strength to do these dramatic stands for humanity and sticking up for goodness? I don't, this, you know, it's a tough call. But in this, I don't know if that answered your question. If you want to rephrase it. If I, like, um, I guess, for someone, if they're going to maybe, uh, like, how would evil, how should evil be punished or acknowledged at least from that standpoint? Oh, well, in the Christian world, we say you are never punished because of your sins, you are punished by them. Mm -hmm. So the evil person who lies will never know what it's like to be the truth. The person who doesn't become a good parent will never know what it's like to be a good parent. And, the, and when you go to prison, their psychostructure in their mind cannot imagine a world where you don't lie, cheat, and murder. You just don't get caught. Well, you're just like me, right? How can you be honest? So the punishment for evil is the result of evil. As you sow, so shall you reap. What you do comes back to you, and, and you are punished in one way or another. You don't have to be punished by the state. Evil is its own punishment, and you have become less of who you can be. Now, if the, if the question was, should the state punish you? Is that the question? Or, uh, I, I guess more, more of like a philosophical thing. Yeah. In this world, one thing that doesn't need a judge or a jury is the laws of nature. You know, you physics, you jump out of the room, it doesn't care what your conviction is, you're going to get hurt. You jump up the second or third floor, you're going to get hurt. And 
spiritually and psychologically, if you do evil things, you are being changed. The very first person that is affected by your choices is you. And there are very serious human repercussions from making your heart less sensitive to the goodness that you should enjoy. Instead, you have a heart that sometimes can't cry, can't laugh, can't enjoy another person's achievement because you're being punished by yourself. You know, there, there's an old saying, you know, God doesn't send anyone to hell. People go there. They choose it. And, and in the Russian and the Catholic Orthodox field, this is also true. You have to believe in hell, but you don't have to believe anyone's in it. Because the church doesn't put, we say who we think is a saint, is a good person, who's, who's been in the struggle and has maintained and lifted up their humanity and the humanity of other people. You know. But whatever people call themselves, it's not as important as who they really are. Names don't save anybody. Neither do social, religious, or atheistic systems. What you really believe in what you do depends on your future. A name is just a name. hurts and we all have to well how do I handle the pain maintain your humanity maintain your integrity and maybe even with practice and time and I think God's grace that you can be a healing person to those people who even hurt you but but you you are the priority you know you have to put the oxygen on yourself before you can save anyone else in your family even your own children so take care of yourself first because you can't take care of anyone else then so, but, but the pain is real, but it's counterintuitive. You know, revenge, oh man, I'm going to get him or her. You know, it's almost counterintuitive. Don't. Save yourself. Be creative. Why have you wasted your life on someone else's garbage? But it hurts. Yeah, it does. Endure the pain. It's a struggle. Yes, it is. Anything good is worth struggling, and you are worth fighting for. And that's in all the Russian novels. The struggle is real. And people who have been through the system where some injustice has been done and they have survived and maintained their dignity, yes, there's a beauty and resilience that can be gained no other way. I went through the fight. I didn't give in. But it feels so good. Let me ruin someone else's life. And then let me speak about how good it is to be a human being. I'm a humanist. I just want to kill him or her. Or them. It's, it's, it's difficult. That's why this conflict and struggle, it's in every one of our lives. You don't got to be told about it. You're going through it, and you will go through it. And, you know, the goal is, from this point of view, is save yourself and others, and I don't care what the faith belief or lack of faith, if that person is good, we're on the same side. We're trying to do the same thing. Religion can be manipulated just like any philosophical viewpoint can be manipulated. Not all humanists are human. I want to ask them each to make a thought. Think of a scene or a, an exchange in one of the novels that you've read, either for our, from our sober or for your oral report or now for your term paper that sheds a light, or this talk that shed a light on the evil that you saw in that scene. Adrian, we'll start with you. We'll go right around the room. So you read six novels, I think, and you read some selections from Solzhenitsyn's um, uh, Gulag. Think of something that struck you, a 
about evil that Father's words now have given us a new flashlight to hold on it, to understand it. I think something that you mentioned with the, the sins, it's not necessarily the, the action itself. So you, you mentioned it was the... Like just the natural system of the, what the, the sinner actually does if, if you're not a, a kind or good parent and you don't get to experience like the joy of a good parent. Sure. So when you see in the books is it is purely the, the negative effects. Um, Are you talking about you're you're always punished by what you do? So if you're not an honest person, you don't know what it's like to be an honest person. Yeah. You miss a lot of goodness if you choose an evil way. So you are automatically, in a way, punished by what you've chosen. Right, and I think it's something clear in the books that we see this. It's not the ideology, it's not the communism, but that is the, 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 the instigator of the evil. It's, it's something deeper within the human being that we experience and can regard the prisoners, or even, even the prisoners themselves, across you know, the, into the world realm. Um, where is the power flow? And so it makes it clear. Yeah, and I think that's important to be able to take this and apply it to some scenes, some characters. John. Um, I'm thinking in Journey to the Whirlwind, um, when one of the uh, political political commanders, Gesnerov, I think it was, when he when he dies, or maybe he's captured, uh, a lot of the, the prisoners, they cheer. But in, the, in that way, it's kind of like, they're in like an, a sphere of evil, so they kind of celebrate the evil of, you know, um, Know, someone being punished for, for their, for their uh, mishaps. But then later on, Inya um, is given the chance to kind of get her revenge on um, one of the officers who um, sentenced her to uh, five to ten years of prison. And she chooses <coughs> to turn the other cheek and give him um, her bread, ra bread ra rations only. So it's kind of like the yes. change from you know celebrating the evil to maybe well, that's a good point. Always be careful if you enjoy someone else's pain. You know, people kiss their cats, dogs, and friends, and, and then they celebrate <coughs> the failures of people. Be very careful if you enjoy someone else's pain. Yeah. It's a danger sign. Um, I've been thinking a lot about the brothers Karamazov, um, and particularly Alyosha. Um, we had a talk from Father McCaffrey, and he talks a lot about kind of this idea of a spiritual transfiguration where our Yosha kind of turned his back away from evil and like chose to do good. And I think that your talk is really reminiscent of that. Um, just kind of this decision, <coughs> like the personal choice to go out and, and seek to do good. Yeah. There's no surrogacy in the human life. You have to choose yourself for yourself. Anya? something that struck me was when you were talking about like uh, like perspective wise um, specifically when you talk about like Jesus on the cross it wasn't like I mean we might think of it as like you know a negative experience or like painful and stuff like that but you talk about like love throughout like that whole experience and like what he thought it to be and like that puts into perspective like throughout the novels there was just like there's been different scenes and different people even if they're not necessarily like religious they have faith in their circumstances and I always like kind of like struggle I was like well, like how are they like so like you know, faithful in these, like, you know, doings in these situations. But there's a specific scene, I'm not going to lie, the books all kind of run together. But um, I think he stepped out and was it, like, snowing or something? And then, like, he had, like, this religious, like, epiphany or, like, he was singing a song. Anyway, I forget what it was, but I have to go back and look. Um, but it was just, like, how, I don't know, it just kind of put it all into perspective. I don't know what I'm trying to say, but it's kind of thinking. You're thinking. Yes. 
there's no good man. There's a lot of religions yeah. that have this born again, or in the Christian tradition, the mystic tradition, these things happen often. Where and in non-religious tradition, in your own life, there's points of insight or points of change or experience that you can. I have been changed by this, you know, and God, from the Christian point of view, God wants effort, not success. You know, God's like the grandfather who's got these crazy drawings on his refrigerator, and people say, oh, you see this? I go, no, I'm, I'm not on drugs. I don't know what it is. See how beautiful it is my grandchild? So other people may look at the life and say, boy, that kid's a loser, and in God's eyes, he may be a winner, because success is not character. But what you choose is character. Well, uh, what you said about forgiveness reminded me a lot of from the brother from Argos, uh the interaction of Father Gerson and his ministry. With the initial bowing, he doesn't understand it or accept it. And then when he has his own, when he has his own come to terms and realizes he needs to forgive others, or like be apologetic for his sins and his guilt, that it like fully comes full circle. So yeah. Excellent. Um, hearing your talk reminded me a lot about this quote from specifically where he's discussing about um, like the perspective of like a torturer and how it's like they're descending from humanity like they're turning into swine and in particular it reminded me also of this idea of repentance and I was raised Catholic and so a lot of the concept is very familiar to me and this idea that repentance is like turning to God whereas the undoing of that and kind of like the descent into evil is descending like from goodness in general um, and I think too that just like was a key concept that I was reminded of because it's also been a while. And the metanoia is recurring. It's in other words, before you do anything bad, there's a series of psychological steps and patterns in your mind. So when, when people begin to change, I can, don't think why you did something bad, you know, but think more. What are the patterns that went to that? And, and you have to change the mindset. Okay, um, so what you just said about um, evil and it being a punishment in and of itself, I think um, it ties into a really consistent theme throughout all the books about the prison camps that we read, wherein um, a lot of the prisoners mention in their memoirs feeling more sorry for the guards or the people that tortured them because um, they, like you're saying, like they're being punished because they have to be themselves, they have to be um, like this evil, they're engaging in this evil, and of course they're being punished. They're, yeah. They've lost their humanity is kind of the main point of what a lot of the, the prisoners say, that they've lost their humanity. So that's, they feel bad for them, even though they're directly inflicting pain onto them. Yeah. I don't think you can love anyone the way you should if you hate anyone. Because yeah. there's only one heart. And we have an Auschwitz survivor in my parish. He just died last year. That's guy happy, you know. It's a, and he always said, I was always free. You know, it's like the slaves that were released after the Civil War. And people said, well, Abraham Lincoln gave you freedom. He says, no, God gave me freedom. Abraham Lincoln acknowledged that. Keep me a couple minutes longer. Luke? Um, uh, the talk kind of reminded me of the, the play that I did my first oral report on, the Something That Belongs to You by Roland Hoffman. Are you? I'm not familiar with that play. So in, um, basically it follows the story of survivor who faced a lot of anti-Semitism and sort of just uh, ostracization right, uh, at the hands uh, uh, when she lived in Ukraine um, during the Holocaust. And despite being saved by a Ukrainian family, she still s held a lot of sort of hatred in her heart and like distrust for Ukrainians in general. Mm -hmm. And um, sort of what you commented on how evil can, um, you know, sort of... It can infect your happiness. It has nothing to do with those people in Ukraine. Yeah. Because it's like that accident. Okay, people hurt you, okay. But then why are you hurting yourself? You can, you can be mistrustful, you can be cautious, you know, but don't spit in your own soup. <laughs> um, so I did my first or <coughs> oral report on the poem called The Twelve about the 12 members of the Red Guard marching through Russia. Alexander uh, And it's a very uh, heavily Christian influenced poem, but there was one part where one of the members of the Red Guard, um, he marches across uh, 
the woman that he loves and she had become a prostitute and was he caught her in the act and she immediately begged for forgiveness and he sh shot and killed her immediately um, and he thought that would fix all of his problems and as he continues marching through the city the dread slowly starts kind of layering onto him and he feels weighted down by it um, and it just reminded me of what you said when I asked you my question earlier the first he um, he didn't forgive her and that was what was making him feel awful about himself because mm -hmm. it sure. didn't matter that she begged for forgiveness it didn't matter about anything he didn't forgive her and he took away any chance of that happening so it, throughout the end of the poem he just uh, he feels so weighted down and he doesn't feel like himself anymore and I think that's probably why Jesus says to a little condo Jesus says whoever has much forgiven loves much mm -hmm. and prostitutes and sinners will be in heaven before the Pharisees so mm -hmm. Jesus has an idea of the struggle we're all in yeah we're over but can you say something Bianca um I just like the part where you said the don't like the forgive or forget type thing just the not forgetting no, I'm sorry, forget. I'd say nobody like in a bunch of novels that we read like no one forgot what went yeah, you should, you like. shouldn't remember because you, you want to know where the holes are before you step into them um, what you said about like how people choose to put themselves in hell and it's not like um, their actions in hell themselves. It reminded me of like the scene, I think, during from the whirlwind where one of the prisoners she ends up committing suicide because she realized like she had inadvertently like sent a lot of people to death camps without telling them like the order she had also put herself there. And I think like the suicide was obviously her like form of self punishment um, and how she chose to treat like her own family. Pain is not forgiveness, sorrow is. If it was so easy, just pain forgiving you. No, pain doesn't do nothing. Um, your talk really reminded me of Solzhenitsyn and the Gulag of Archipelago and how, um, kind of like Dominique was saying, he was able to um, look at his torturers and realize that their actions were what was evil and it wasn't them necessarily mm -hmm. and how if he was in their position, he might be doing the same um, evil things. And in this way, when he's able to separate their actions, to make it through the camps because he knew it wasn't that these humans were evil, it's like that actions were evil. So he still had this faith that he helped them to make it through when he was yeah. off. You are either part of the problem or you're part of the solution. Excellent. Sam? Um, I had just finished watching the movie Mr. Jones, and Walter is in the movie, I think, is so like true evil that kind of discussing like what was going on. And by someone, um, but they still can have the ability to uh, start over to decorate their garden again. Um, just like you have just said, um, although God cannot control everything, including uh, evil, and evil makes this uh, prisoner suffer, but uh, God gave these people the ability to uh, trust others again and continue to seek him uh, hope in their lives. Yeah, I agree. Thank you, uh, Remind me of like um, that journey into Lola and Genia, like you learned that like she um, ends up going back to the Communist Party because of how much she was able to forgive and like I guess understand that like Stalin perverted the goals of like like completely manipulated like the uh, the ideals of communism and how she like kind of understood that hope for like the best for the future. Yeah, the former seminarian who became an atheist and gave no credit to either group. That's right. So let's finish it up, Chloe. Um, and so. You talked a little bit about um, kind of combating and living in a world of evil by having trust, and I think it also kind of made me think about how it also requires faith, and how faith is something that you know goes across people regardless of religion, and we can see that in a lot of the books we read with people devoutly religious, um, you know, combating evil and like truly like shining as like good people, but also you know people who weren't devoutly religious. Christians um, kind of sometimes have a hierarchy kind of like okay. view towards other, you know, groups of people. Um, yeah. I try to be devoutly humanistic. Yeah. <laughs>
Father, I want to thank you so much for all of us. My honor to be with you. Sorry about keeping you overtime, but it's a pleasure to be with you. It was so worth having you here. Thank you so much.